welcome. <laughs> um, this is a program we've been looking to have for months and months. We almost had Henry in person, it was a year and a half ago, and yeah. the brother didn't cooperate. And then, so we've been learning a lot about climate change, but we finally have Henry with us. Um, and this has been Harriet Choice. Um, her passion is climate change, and she's our connection to Henry. And I'm going to ask Harriet to introduce us, and we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. So, welcome, Harriet. Thank you, Beth. Hi, Henry. Hi, Harriet. Um, uh, I want to introduce this, particularly tonight, because we've had so much lately about climate change in the news. Um, our new president, President Biden, is promoting what he's going to do, that uh, climate change will be a part of his infrastructure plan. <clears throat> so today, we want Henry to tell us what might he do? We know that there are at least two bills out there. One, went for all of you who were there a year ago last January, we heard about the fee and dividend. And then last in the House, and then last August, our very own Senator Durbin introduced a bill. Is that right, Henry? Yes. Now, maybe we can get Henry and to explain to us the difference between the bills, explain to us, will our president consider any kind of carbon fee or the ugly word tax? We know that he wants to do renewable energy. We hear about the electric cars and the wind and the sun and the solar. So Henry, please tell us what the bills are. Do they have a chance of passing? And can we do anything about carbon without a fee or tax? And you might include anything that's in the Green New Deal. Is that enough of a load to ask you? <laughs> <laughs> Harry, you, you, you never fail to disappoint. Um, and, and that was one heck of an introduction and a lot to unpack in that question there. But I, I got it. And, and thank you very much for that, Harriet, and, and for the introduction. And everyone, it's a pleasure to be here and pleasure to uh, join you. Um, again, I'm Henry, Henry Moss from Citizens Climate Lobby. And um, we will uh, do our very best to give you some of the basics of climate change, what Citizens Climate Lobby is doing about it, maybe what you can do about it. And so we'll cover the basics. We'll take a look at the urgency of climate change look at um, a couple of the policies that Harriet had mentioned and uh, talk about how all of us can be part of the solution. So I thought uh, before we get started, and Harriet uh, has really led the charge here, um, to get a couple of burning questions that, that you have, and I'm going to write those down. I'll do my best to cover them in the presentation. And uh, if I don't cover them in the presentation, we'll get them in Q&A. But Harriet, since you started trouble here with a, a, a lot of questions, if you would streamline it down to your favorite burning question, I'm going to write that down. What, what's, your, what's your favorite question there you want me to try to answer? We have two major bills. Can you tell us what they are and what is the difference? All right, you got that. Um, Beth, we've been talking for a year. Do you have a burning question? I think that um, covers it. That one of the, the main gist is, as we get into advocacy, and I think that covers it. Um, what I didn't do before was to give a little introduction about you and how you got involved in it in the Citizens Climate Lobby with your background. But if you want to do two or three sentences, <laughs> it, well, it's um, whatever you want to do. You you lead it. Okay. Well. Um, You've been part of the Citizens Climate Lobby for how many years? Uh, more than I want to admit, about eight. Okay, so you've got lots of experience, and you're gonna, and you're, you'll roll that in, into what you're talking about. So yes. go ahead. <laughs> okay, all right. So advocacy is, I take one of your questions, Beth, and uh, the yeah. two major bills. Meryl, I, I haven't had a chance to meet you. Is Meryl here? Yeah. Hi, Meryl. Nice <laughs> to meet you. Do you have a burning question for me? You have to unmute. There you go. 
my burning question when you got to carbon fee and so-called dividend. Okay. I have a burning question. Uh, All right, what carbon fee and dividends about or what? No, I understand that. I understand the importance and the positiveness in uh, carbon fee. I don't see how the dividend will hurt. Carbon fee will also cost the poor more than anyone and the poor will never be able to take advantage of the dividend, the, the dirt poor. We're talking about the poorest people in this country who don't have charge accounts. They don't have bank accounts. They, none of them will receive a stimulus check. Um, and this is not undocumented immigrants. This is people, this is US citizens who are poor, who don't have access to things like a bank account. So, okay, so the, the impact of the dividend, positive or negative? Uh, no, I, I think that I, I just think it's unrealistic. I don't think, I think you're telling people that they're going to get money, but the people who need money aren't going to get it. Okay. All right. Should be taxed for sure. Yeah, that's included in the impact, but go ahead. All right. So we'll, Mer Merrill, we'll do our best to cover that for you. Thank you for that. Um, anybody else have a burning question you want me to note? All right. Well, then we'll 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 leave it at those three. But I'm sure there'll be more questions when we get to to Q and A. So I am going to share some slides, and we'll start this presentation. Thank you for those questions. Somebody have their hand. Uh, those that Barbara, uh, Scott. Kind of... Oh. Barbara Scott. Oh, she had her hand up. Okay, Barbara. Actually, it was her husband, Brent. I'm a member of CCL too, the Southern uh, Illinois chapter. Um, Hi, Brant. I guess my question, uh, CCL's goal is to have climate legislation be bipartisan. It just my question would be, do you think that's even achievable? Do we have to just keep pushing without Republican uh, involvement? Okay, great question. Thank you for that. All right, so I'm going to start this presentation so that um, we get uh, some more questions stated as we as get into the, I'm going to take about 20, 25 minutes here and we'll, um, we will give you some more fodder for some more questions. Uh, so let's see if we can get this to work. Everyone should be seeing a um, picture of Capitol building. And um, if you click on the upper right, you can look at the screen. If not, if you can see the Capitol building and a, maybe a thumbnail of me, then, then that's good enough. Is everybody there? If you're, if you're not, please uh, send a, a chat to Melissa or Beth. They'll help you out. Beth, is, are you hearing any, any major technical issues or are we looking pretty good? I think we're looking good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, all right. Well, this, this is a picture of our last trip up to D.C. Uh, this was uh, obviously before COVID. There were about 1,500 of us. We had about 500 meetings in just one day working in groups of, of five or six. And uh, um, as Brant can tell you, a CCL member that's part of your group, as well as Norm Kravitz, uh, who I had a chance to, to, to lobby with years ago, it is absolutely exhilarating to, to sit down, talk with our members of Congress, get their perspective on climate change, do our best to find common ground and talk about solutions. And, and the solution that Citizens Climate Lobby feels is the best solution is simply putting a price on carbon. So Citizens Climate Lobby is a nonprofit, nonpartisan volunteer organization that's all about helping the common citizen, that's it's all of us here, develop the self-confidence to be able to talk to our members of Congress and tell them what we want. And what we want is a solution to climate change. And again, Citizens Climate Lobby feels the best solution is to simply put a price on carbon. So uh, I've mentioned this, this price on carbon several times. What is it? It, it is really elegant in its simplicity because all it is is just what I said, putting a price on carbon. 
except it's a slowly rising fee on fossil fuels. So what happens, fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas will become increasingly more expensive and less attractive. And then clean energy becomes less expensive and more attractive so that we can push emissions down to safe levels and avert a climate crisis. In essence, that's all it is. Now, there's a few key components that make it work. Ideally, we want bipartisanship. We want Republicans, we want Democrats to get together. For that to happen, it's got to be a free market solution. You've got to give people choice. So if you wanna buy fossil fuels, you'll buy fossil fuels. If you wanna buy clean energy, you're gonna buy clean energy. We're just going to let the price of those products control behavior. It's also gotta be revenue neutral. Can't be a tax, can't grow government. So instead, what will happen, our government will put a carbon fee at the point of extraction of where we get our fossil fuels. So that's a fancy way of, of saying, if Exxon is pumping oil out of a wellhead, there will be a carbon fee that will be placed on that oil that represents the cost of the environmental damage that happens when you burn that fossil fuel, putting way too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, triggering all sorts of very, very expensive extreme weather events. Now, the same thing will happen at the mine shaft where we get coal or the port of entry where we might get foreign oil. Now, all those carbon fees are collected by our government, but not kept. That's why it's not a tax. Instead, those carbon fees will be rebated back, recycled back in equal shares to each American household as a monthly dividend. Now, that monthly dividend is going to be extremely important because it's going to protect the low and middle income American from that slowly rising fee on fossil fuels. Citizens Climate Lobby actually hired a third party consulting from a very prominent think tank called Remy. We asked them to study what the financial value would be, the financial impact of a $250 a month dividend going to each American household. What they found is that it will grow the American economy by about a trillion dollars in 10 years, our GDP in 10 years, a trillion dollars, 2 million jobs in that same 10 year period will, will be increasing. So you see, it's very possible to transition from a fossil fuel economy to a clean energy economy and still grow jobs. Now there's one other critical component that makes the whole thing work. And um, the easiest way to explain it is if we have a, a foreign country that um, is still on fossil fuel and produces products with dirty fossil fuels, cheap, dirty fossil fuels, and tries to send us their products, exporting them to us, we will put a carbon fee border tax on those products, which will make those products non-competitive. And that'll be the inspiration for that foreign country to go back to their home country, do their own carbon fee so they can begin to transition to a clean energy economy. And that's what's gonna catalyze global cooperation. Climate change is a global problem. We have to have a way to catalyze global cooperation and a carbon fee border adjustment is how we're gonna do it. So that in essence is carbon fee and dividend. And so the whole idea behind this is really to create an economic framework to incentivize and unleash entrepreneurial desires to accelerate technical innovation in low carbon technologies. And it's gonna be in three primary areas, energy efficiency in the built environment, transportation, and our power grid. Now, energy efficiency in the built environment, did you know heating, lighting, and cooling our buildings is 40% of our carbon footprint? It's an amazing, amazing fact. And, and here's the great news. We know how to build energy efficient buildings. We know how to retrofit old leaky buildings. That's a 40% solution to our carbon footprint. It is low hanging fruit. 
transportation. We know how to build electric vehicles. We know how to do electrification of our public transport. That is a 30% carbon footprint. It's a 30% solution. Between the two of them, you got a 70% solution. Our power grid, we know how to do renewables. We know how to do wind, solar, geothermal. In fact, we, we've developed all of the technology. We own the patents. We know how to do it. And we're very good with battery storage. And we're coming up with new ideas on different ways to store our energy when the sun's burning bright and the wind's blowing. It's called electrolysis and it creates hydrogen. And there's a whole story there to be told on how we can store our energy when the wind's not blowing and the sun's, uh, sun's not shining. At any rate, the key to here to remember is that's a 20% of our carbon footprint. So between all three of them, energy efficiency in the built environment, transportation, and our power grid, that's low hanging fruit. And that's a 90% solution to solve our problem. So we can clean our air, clean our water, bring emissions down, have great clean energy jobs for everyone and a bright future ahead. So remember that when I start telling you about the tipping points, which might create a little anxiety. Here's our two climate uh, leaders, two of the climate leaders. There's more than that, but I'm going to focus on these two gentlemen. Uh, Ted Deutsch is a congressman out of Florida and Senator Durbin, our Illinois own Senator Durbin. Uh, he is 76, very well might be his last term in office. Maybe he'll run more, but uh, hopefully he'll leave a legacy to, to solve climate change. Both of these gentlemen have put together um, policies that are carbon pricing policies. They are carbon pricing policy leaders in Congress, along with, with others. Uh, White House being another key one, and Braun, uh, there's, there's several. But um, let's focus on these two uh, congressmen. Uh, Ted Deutsch has uh, sponsored the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. And let me tell you briefly about it. It puts a price on carbon emissions, starting at $15 a ton of carbon emissions, growing $10 a ton each year thereafter. Now, 100% of the revenues collected will go back to the American people as a monthly dividend. So that's very critical because that'll protect the low and middle income American from that slowly rising fee on fossil fuels. Two thirds of Americans will come out ahead or even with the dividend. That's what all the studies are showing. It will have a carbon fee border adjustment to catalyze global cooperation. This bill is 100% market driven, so Republicans love it. Republicans are all about market-based solutions. So this is the bill that is most likely to get bipartisan support. Right now, there's 40 co-sponsors this Congress. All of them are Democrats. Right now, we don't have any Republicans that have co-sponsored this legislation. So that's the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act in a nutshell. Now, when it comes to Senator Durbin's bill, the American Clean Future Fund Act, the, the main difference, Harriet, just, and I'm sure you're aware of this, it's more comprehensive, it's more aggressive. It starts at $25 a ton of emissions for the first year out, and it grows by 10, 15, 20, $25 a ton each year thereafter, based on emissions reduction and timeline. Now, the distinction is only 75% of the revenues collected are actually given back to the American people. It's means tested, which means that, uh, and Merrill, this might uh, address some of your concerns, those individuals that are making $150, I take it back, $150,000 a year on a joint return get a reduced dividend. Those that make $75 a year with single tax returns get a reduced dividend. And with those reductions, that's how our government will harness 25% of the total revenues. And those revenues that our government keep will be used to kickstart the clean energy economy. So we're not going to leave it to chance. We're going to let our government give seed money to make sure low carbon technologies are developed. 
15% of that 25% of revenues that are kept will go into a green bank. The actual name uh, in Durban's bill is called the Climate Change Finance Corporation. It will be a new agency that will be implemented within the executive branch, and it will give guaranteed loans and grants to those uh, technologies that are the technologies that we want to develop for low carbon emissions. And 10% of that 25% is going to go to help marginalized communities that have suffered the most from climate change. It definitely is focused on environmental justice. It will help communities that are adjacent to uh, refineries, adjacent to coal burning power plants, toxic uh, sites will be cleaned up, health issues need to be addressed. And those individuals that are doing fossil fuel jobs will be given training to have the new jobs for clean energy. So Durban is, again, you can see much more prescriptive, much, much more comprehensive. So really his bill in essence is a combination of market-based solution and big hand of government. I like to think of it as soft guardrails to assure that we develop the clean energy industry. Um, I want you to think about the success we've had with vaccine development with COVID. That started from our government providing seed funding to the National Institute of Health. And from those funds, we developed our vaccine for COVID, that life-saving vaccine that hopefully we all have on board in our bodies right now, protecting all of us. So we can do the same thing with government research dollars and funding and support for developing the low carbon technologies that we need urgently. We need them as soon as possible. So um, those are the two bills. Those are some of the primary differences. I wanna highlight this because I find this picture extremely exciting. This is a picture of the latest, greatest solar power utility plant built in uh, out just outside of Las Vegas. Um, this happened about three or four years ago. It's called Crescent Dune. And the technology is fascinating. Um, you have thousands of mirrors that surround this receiving tower, beaming all the sun's energy and light to the top of the tower, which is transferred down the tower to a huge insulated tank that has potassium salts in there, as well as sodium salts in there that become so hot, they mimic lava, which boils water, pushes steam to drive a generator 24 seven. And um, we are truly, when you think about this kind of technology on the precipice of a new frontier to be a clean energy superpower, really no different than we all can remember when President Kennedy at Rice University threw down the gauntlet that we were gonna get a man on the moon in the next 10 years. And we did, the great American ethos of can do, we did. And we got Neil Armstrong on the moon in 1969. We can do it now, we need to do it now. And um, if we don't do it, anybody who's got their mute button off, you tell me, who do you think's gonna lead the charge if America doesn't take world leadership? Who do you think will be leading the charge? Oh. <laughs> China. Maybe China, China, absolutely. And chi whoever, was that you, Beth? Who said China? Me, Beth. Hey, okay, good for you. All right, Beth. Um, it is China. And, and the reason is because China, as much as they're burning coal and uh, they don't want to stop burning coal until 10 years from now, I'm sure you all got that message when uh, the climate summit happened, which is, is not going to, that can't happen because uh, we've only got eight to 10 years to turn this around. But China's cornered the market on solar. They're smart. 70% of our solar panels are coming from China. So, and the, and the thing that's terrible about this is we own the patents for solar, wind, and geothermal. We need to develop this technology and, and provide it to the world. Let the world know that democracy works and here is a great low carbon solution to the issues we're facing with climate change. So we need to step it up. So at any rate, um, I wanna point out two really important studies that came out in November of 2018. We all know that there is 
scientific consensus that climate change is real, it's human cause, and we got to do something about it. These studies that came out during Trump's administration were buried on Black, uh, Black Friday, came out in November 2018, but these are prominent studies. The first one there on the left-hand side of the screen, the IPCC special report, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, commissioned by the United Nations. It is the preeminent organization on climate change, housing hundreds of our world's leading climate scientists. And then um, the Fourth National Climate Assessment, a mandated, a federally mandated study that is required by our government every four years. Both of these studies, housing hundreds of our world's leading climate scientists, are saying we got eight to 10 years to turn this around before we hit severe destabilization of Earth's climate, which is very grim news, guys. And I apologize for being depressing. That's the reality. So uh, we need to do something about it. It's urgent. So I can't express that to you enough because remember, these, came, these studies came out in 2018. They said we have eight to 10 years. So we get take the best case scenario that we had 10 years back in 2018. That was two years ago. We have eight years. So you see how ludicrous it is for China to say they're going to reach peak oil by 2030. We have to have the problem solved by 2030. So even before then. So there is a tremendous sense of urgency. It's a wake up call that all of us need to be part of the solution. And I don't want to be pandemic, pandemic here, but you know, uh, I'm Jewish, you're Jewish. I got to tell you this one thing. I'm sure you all know Rabbi Kirshner. He said something very powerful in one of his books. I'm a big fan of uh, Rabbi Kirshner. He said, when you think there's nothing you can do, think about an infinitesimal drop of water that coalesces with another drop, creating a trickle, creating a stream, creating a river, creating a torrent to carve the Grand Canyon. Great things can happen when people come together. So all of us need to be part of the solution. We all need to be part. And I promise to tell you how to be part of the solution very easily once, once a week. So enough of me on my soapbox. Sorry about that, guys. Um, Beth told me, Henry, whatever you do, don't talk to my membership about the basics of climate change. They're <laughs> smart. They got it. Don't bore them. So I won't. I promise. <clears throat> but I do have to show you this one picture that I love. This is from Space Lab. And uh, you can see our crescent moon in the background there, and Earth is in the foreground. And that thin white onion skin surrounding the Earth, that is our atmosphere. It's miraculous. That's where all the physics are happening with climate change. Had to show you that, guys. So we're going to rifle through all my, all my discussion on the basics of climate change. But I do want to hang on this one slide. I want to emphasize that since the Industrial Revolution of the 1880s, we have burned a lot of coal, oil, and gas, putting way too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, actually 43% more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere now, today, than we had before the Industrial Revolution of the 1880s. So I want you to image a polka dotted blue blanket surrounding the earth of carbon dioxide, holding in way too much heat, triggering all sorts of extreme weather events. So since the Industrial Revolution, we have had a very consistent 280 parts per million concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution and 50 million years before that discovered through ice cores. And we can get into that discussion later. Fascinating science. But the main thing to remember is from the Industrial Revolution, our concentration of CO2 has grown from 280 parts per million to 415 parts per million, raising the average global temperature 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So why would the scientists care about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit? We've got this massive planet. How could 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit possibly hurt our beautiful mass of Earth? I'm gonna give you a little context. And maybe you know the answer, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna emphasize this. The last ice age that we had that put us into miles high ice 
in the North American continent for 50,000 years happened from just a five degree drop in average global temperature. So it takes a very little change in our average global temperature to have a profound effect on our global climate. So the scientists care about that tiny little 1.8 degree Fahrenheit rise in average global temperature because it's triggering all sorts of extreme weather events. I am sure with the 16 people on this call that there are some skeptics that might be thinking, nah, we've always had extreme weather. We've always had wildfires, droughts, and hurricanes. And I would agree with you. You are absolutely right. We've always had extreme weather. But I'm not talking about extreme weather. I'm talking about historically unprecedented extreme weather, weather that has never happened before. And I realize we're skeptical maybe in the Midwest because we're actually insulated from the very worst effects on climate change. We don't see sea level rise they have in Miami every year, do we? Or the five or six years of drought that California had or uh, Typhoon Haiyan that happened in the Philippines, 220 mile per hour winds that ripped that country and killed 10,000 people, destroyed a million homes and put 4 million environmental refugees in the street. We don't see that in Chicago. So it's easy to become Eh, not happening in my backyard. I don't know. This is, doesn't apply to me. Oh, but it does. Historically unprecedented extreme weather may not be happening in Chicago, but it's happening all around the world. If you start connecting the dots, historically unprecedented extreme weather, it's the early warning sign of severe destabilization of Earth's climate. Do you know what this picture is? Anybody know? Shout it out. It's the aftermath of what? Anybody? Hurricane. Hurricane. Say again? Hurricane in Houston. Yes, ma'am. Hurricane Harvey. You got it. Who was that? That was Julie, but my husband, Jamie, is the one that really deserves the credit. <laughs> we'll give it a Julie, Jamie, uh, uh, A+. Plus. Yes, Hurricane Harvey. <laughs> um, and and uh, they got 52 inches of rain dumped on Houston in 48 hours. It never happened before. Never happened, historically unprecedented. It's directly related to the long-term impact of a warming planet. Where do you think the 1.8 degree Fahrenheit, or if you think in centigrade, the 1.2, 1.5 degrees centigrade is being held on earth? Where is it being stored? The sky. No, another guess. The oceans. Yes, who said that? Kathy. Kathy, wow, we got some climate aficionados here. I love it. Yes, it's stored in our oceans, a great thermal sink, right? That's where that 1.8 degree is stored. Hurricanes are naturally spawned from warmer ocean waters, but our ocean waters now are warmer and they go deeper. So when Hurricane Harvey hit, it naturally pulled from that warm ocean water dumping on Houston, right? But it kept pulling and pulling from that warm ocean water dumping on Houston and pulling and pulling because those ocean waters are warmer and deeper and it didn't suppress itself until finally, after 48 hours, it hit enough cold water, it was suppressed, but not until after an unprecedented, historically unprecedented amount of water fell on Houston. It's directly related to the long-term impact of a warming planet. The oceans have warmed over time. It's not a cycle. It's not weather. It's long-term warming of our planet. That's climate change. So we are truly in a race, everyone, to stop the burning of fossil fuels. You heard it over the last two days last week with the climate summit. We want to stop the burning of fossil fuels. I always put everything in Fahrenheit, so I hope I'm not causing confusion <laughs> to what you've been hearing on, um, on the news. Um, we definitely don't want to get from 1.5 degrees centigrade to 2 degrees centigrade. I think of it in Fahrenheit, 1.8 degree Fahrenheit to 2.7 degree Fahrenheit, because when we hit 2.7 degree Fahrenheit, we're going to hit tipping points to severe destabilization. So Beth said to me, Henry, I want you to cover the tipping points. My people don't know about the tipping points, so cover it. So I apologize for uh, the anxiety this can be producing, but you know what? We are at the 11th hour. 
So it's important that you hear it and um, we'll be short and sweet on this. First tipping point, Arctic ice shelf is melting. We've lost over 40% of our Arctic ice shelf since 1979. And boy, oh boy, do we need that Arctic ice shelf. It moderates the Earth's temperature. It is a giant air conditioner reflecting the sun's heat back into outer space. But as our Earth is warming, remember that polka dot of blue blanket holding in the heat? Earth is warming. It's melting the Arctic ice shelf. So now we have less of an Arctic ice shelf to reflect back the sun's heat. More will melt. We get even warmer temperatures. More will melt even further. The Arctic ice shelf is less effective at reflecting the sun's heat back. It is a vicious cycle, a terrible chain reaction. They, the technical term is a positive feedback loop. It amplifies the heat effect on Earth. Remember, amplifies the heat effect on Earth. If we do nothing, our planet will get warmer and warmer and warmer to perhaps becoming uninhabitable. This is the issue. So the next tipping point, the um, permafrost is melting. Now permafrost is no big deal. It is just frozen soil that goes thousands of feet deep in the Arctic tundra. It's quite unique because it has tons and tons of prehistoric organic matter locked in it, frozen. But as the earth is warming and the permafrost is thawing, so is all that prehistoric organic matter that begins to thaw and Sweet. decompose without oxygen. That process is called anaerobic decomposition, a fancy way to say the stuff is rotten without oxygen and it off gases methane. Methane is an extraordinarily potent global greenhouse gas, 30 times more potent than CO2. Remember that polka dot of blue blanket of carbon dioxide surrounding the earth holding in more heat? Now imagine a layer of methane around that polka dot of blue blanket, except this is super insulated foam that's surrounding the polka dot of blue blanket, really holding in the heat really causing some issues with severe destabilization versus climate. So as our earth is warming, more permafrost is melting. And again, another vicious chain reaction, a positive feedback loop that amplifies the heat effect on earth. Last tipping point that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is ocean acidification. With all of that extra carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, Part of the natural carbon cycling is carbon dioxide will dissolve in our ocean, but we've got an excessive amount dissolving in the ocean forming carbonic acid. So ocean acidification is first seen with the loss of our coral reefs. We've lost over 50% of our coral reefs around the world. It is the canary in the mine, including the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. We've lost a tremendous amount of the coral reefs. They're not lush and beautiful colors teeming with life. They're bleached out white and dead. That is an early warning sign, a canary in the mine. The real issue though, if you can see that little guy on the right-hand side of your screen, does anybody know what that little guy is? Floats in all of the surfaces of our ocean. What is it? I'll see it. Plankton? Yes. Is that you, Beth? <laughs> wow, you're scoring big. I owe you a beer. That's good. Yes, phytoplankton. It is an amazing one cell plant that floats in all of the surfaces of our ocean. It is at the beginning of the ocean food web. Herbivores eat the phytoplankton, carnivores eat the herbivores, and you get the magnification of this miraculous ocean food web of which billions of people around our planet depend but phytoplankton is sensitive to acidification. If we lose the phytoplankton, we lose our ocean food web potentially, and, and billions of people around the planet are at risk for the loss of a major food source. Mm -hmm. But not only that, phytoplankton, believe it or not, is responsible for 70% of our oxygen production on earth. Oh my. If we lose the phytoplankton, we lose a valuable source of oxygen supply for our planet. The other 
comes from our rainforest. And if you, as I'm sure you all heard during the climate summit, Bolsonaro said, I'm going to continue to cut it down because I want to make quick profits. Oh, you don't want me to cut it down? Pay me some money. You know what? That might be something we need to do. Um, but that's, that's down the road at Glasgow at any rate. Um, that phytoplankton is extraordinarily important and that's at risk. So these, uh, these tipping points, I told you they'd produce anxiety. If you're not familiar with them, um, they keep me up at night and uh, they keep me going. Um, working with members of Congress that are like stone walls, but it keeps me going because I know what the science is saying. I know we got to do something. Um, so here's the thing. You know, you can get anxious, put your head in the sand and do nothing. Or you can choose to be courageous. And I believe all of us, all of us can be courageous, move forward and choose to advocate for innovative policy solutions that will solve climate change. The good news is we already have a couple of great carbon pricing bills in Congress. So we need to be courageous. We need to advocate for a carbon pricing solution. And you can advocate for both of them. The American Clean Future Fund Act and the Energy Innovation Carbon, uh, I'm sorry, the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, both of those policies are, are rock solid policies. We wanna have every carbon pricing uh, leader in Congress, our friend, we need to get them around the table, get the best minds, they need to collaborate and, and figure out how they're gonna mark up the bills and get the best bill out there because we have to have that happen. These bills will bring emissions down to safe levels within eight to 10 years and avert a climate crisis. So we've got to step up and, and be part of the solution. And I'm going to empower you all. I'm sure you all know about the importance of emailing. Certainly, every time I see Durbin's uh, staffers or Duckworth or my Congressman Schneider here in the Highland Park Deerfield area, they always want to know, what do my constituents think? They don't do anything without hearing from you. So emails are critical. Calls are critical. So CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby, has a really easy way for you to do it. Uh, CCLUSA.org slash write. We'll get your right to Senator Durbin and Duckworth. There's a pre-written message of which I'm busy working with my, my uh, uh, Vice President of Government Affairs at, at CCL to change the, the automated message because it's just all off. It needs to be changed, and I'm working on that. So another week, you'll have a different message, or you can just X out the messages there and write your own. And if you don't want to use CCL's website, don't do it. Just go directly to, to the uh, member of Congress's uh, website. But this website, it's a really easy way to do it. Literally, once you do it and populate your information the first time, uh, the second time, it literally takes 30 seconds. I put a calendar reminder in my phone. So once a week, I'm emailing Durbin, Duckworth, and Schneider. And I call them as well. I'm a squeaky wheel. And um, every time I call, every time I write, a staffer in that office is making note. And uh, I change my message up or I keep it the same. But that is important. If you aren't the squeaky wheel, we will not get the grease. So that's one key way. I'm going to mention just a few others and we'll open up for Q&A. Remember, you all can become members like, oh, I forgot, Brant, Brant, like Brant and Norm Kravitz. Both of those gentlemen are, are part of your group. They have become members of Citizens Climate Lobby. You can too. You can be um, clued in on the pulse speed of policy. And uh, when COVID's over, you can go in person and visit your members of Congress. It's, it's a lot of fun. It really is. And it's a great, uh, a great feeling to be with like-minded people. So join CCL. Start your own CCL chapter in your North Chicago Jewish Women's League. You could even start your own chapter or Norm Kravitz is part of the Chicago North Citizens Climate Lobby membership. You can do that. Um, the other thing is I want to encourage you, if you are not offsetting your carbon footprint for heating, lighting, cooling, or building your own driving of your car, your airline miles, there's easy ways to offset your own carbon footprint. Carbonfund.org. Carbonfund.org. I do it every year. It costs me about $350 to offset my entire carbon footprint. My money goes into reforestation. It goes into um, uh, wind and solar 
farms and regenerative agriculture. So uh, uh, those uh, dollars will be used to propel those industries to offset my carbon footprint. So uh, that's another way you can do it. And then I'm sure everybody knows about 350.org and their mission is all about divesting. And they've done a great job of having major pension funds divest from the fossil fuel industry. But you can do it personally. I've done it. I used to own an S&P 500 broad-based fund in my retirement account. I have now changed that to Vanguard has a basically an S&P 500 fund, but no fossil fuel companies. It's called ESGV is the symbol. And I own that. And I also own solar and wind indexes to try to vote with my dollars. So divesting from fossil fuels and, and taking some of your investments, if you have them and putting them into the technologies of the future is another way you can vote with your dollars and make a difference. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I think I might've answered um, most of the questions and I think I may have generated a few others. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, um, I think we'll questions answer. Henry, all of a sudden we can't hear you. Um, I think what we'll do is go back and go through some of the questions, um, if that's okay, that, that sure. were written. Okay, yeah. one of the first questions, will, will everyone receive a dividend? And I think you addressed most of that. Yes, as okay. long as you're a citizen, you'll receive a dividend, yes. And okay. um, that's in the Energy um, Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. That's true. With Durbin's bill, it's means tested. So those people that are um, wealthier, more well-to-do, not receive the full dividend. And the reduction of that dividend, those monies will go back to our government to be able to kickstart the clean energy economy by providing grants and guaranteed loans to businesses that are developing low carbon technologies and to help marginalized communities that have suffered. So there's distinctions between the bills. There's a little bit of variation and that's why it's important to support many of the carbon pricing bills because at the end of the day, we wanna get uh, democratic leadership around the table, hammering out what's gonna be the best policy because we got one chance to do this right, guys. Okay, that's interesting, okay. So the um, Durban bill, the means testing so that richer people will get less dividend back. Return. Yes. But, okay. But remember that everybody has a chance to be carbon virtuous. So uh, let's say I have a three car garage, two Maseratis, and I have an airplane <laughs> and I have a 5,000 square foot house. I can choose to be carbon virtuous. I can choose to have leases. I can have an electric powered plane. I can have a highly insulated, very tight, energy efficient house so that even though I may be getting less of a dividend because I make $5 million a year, my dividend will still proportionally be pretty large because I'm energy efficient. So you do have a chance to still have a decent dividend if you are carbon virtuous. It's just that the low and middle income American typically are more carbon virtuous because we don't have three cars and an airplane and a yacht and two houses, okay. if that explains it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, CC said, what's the rationale for doing um, this at the place of extraction versus where it's used? Okay. Um, we are an oil-based economy. So everything starts with oil. So if we put a price, a carbon fee at the point of extraction or where we get our oil, our coal, um, then it'll trickle down to everything. So I may, pay, I may be paying more at the gas pump. And I also might be paying more for this shirt because it was produced by a company that was using energy that was not renewable. So it's all going to be reflected in our goods based on going all the way at the base level of where we get our energy because that trickles throughout the economy. Does that explain it? Yeah, to me, 
Any anyone else? Uh, well, so uh, this is uh, I, I I think that was my question. This is Kathy. So no. um, it's a. I guess the question I have is it still doesn't necessarily reduce demand. I mean, we need more than just taxing onto the place where it whoops, the place where it exists, but it still doesn't reduce demand. Uh, people are still going to be able to pay a dollar more for that shirt or a dollar more for their gas, and they're not going to quit driving a, a gas powered car. So how do we also shift demand and that or is the answer to that where your technology improvements come in? Um, well, that's a great question. And and um, you partially answered it. It is about demand. If we have something we don't want, Economics 101 says you put a bigger price on it. Remember that with a carbon fee, it's going to be increasing slowly over time. You can't slap. See, it's a very delicate balance that the economists are all arguing about is where do we start the carbon fee? If we started at $135 a ton of emissions, it's going to crash the economy because we're an oil-based economy. So you have to start it at a level that is a little bit of a pinch and a wake-up call, a strong market signal that, hey, guess what, guys? We're shifting to clean energy. Uh-oh, maybe I better think about that electric vehicle. Maybe I better insulate my attic. Uh, hmm. Oh, next year, that carbon fee gets a little bit bigger. And each year, it keeps growing. With... Um, because it's in my mind with Durbin's bill, if we don't meet emission reductions within 10 years, the, the, the carbon fee will be upwards of $135 a ton. So people will vote with their dollars because when you see that gas at the gas pump is so much more, it'll start to make economic sense to buy an electric vehicle, particularly if our government is providing tax credits to get that electric vehicle. So it's about reducing subsidies to the fossil fuel industries, providing tax credit for the new low carbon technologies. Um, but so a it's, general- It's sort of market-based along with tax incentives. Depending on the policy that you're talking about, you got it. Yes. Um, what other questions? Good, good. I have good. a question. Well, I, Beth, oh, okay. yeah, go ahead. I was going to go through some of the questions. I, my question is, last year, we lost two beaches. Our lakes are getting higher. And the air in Chicago was, there was a period where it was worse than the air in LA because of ozone. Henry, aren't both of these um, part of what's going on with warming? Well, um, and Harriet, thank you. I got to say publicly to all of you here, Harriet has been um, a wonderful advocate for climate change, and she is very well read, and she curated a variety of um, uh, news clips and um, studies that she sent to me and videos. And uh, you know what, Harriet, thank you publicly for all of that information that you sent me, and I appreciate your passion. And you know, I, I want to make one suggestion before I answer your question. That um, that video that you sent me on Bernie Sanders in committee, you should make that public. I really encourage everybody here, if you have interest in the issue of climate change, it really uh, is just an outstanding video. It's only 20 minutes long, and it's just outstanding. So thank you, Harriet, and I encourage you to share that Bernie Sanders video with your crew here. Um, when it comes to Illinois, um, there was uh, uh, an interesting study that came out just Friday. The impacts of climate change on Illinois. And I had said earlier, um, uh, us Midwestern folks get a little bit complacent because although Harriet's right, we're beginning to see some changes with beaches being disrupted, with bad air, with the ozone. In general, we don't suffer like they do with, with sea level rise every day in Miami. What I said about California, the terrible drought, well, now you add that, wildfires, mudslides, more droughts, more wildfires. I mean, we're loading up with hurricanes on the East Coast, West Coast, plenty of fires. There's, there's plenty of problems everywhere. Illinois, you're not seeing them as, as, as up front and center, but they're there and boy, they're coming. 
we're we're seeing more droughts during the summer. We're seeing more of a deluge of rain during the spring. And this report that came out by Dr. Uh, Don Weebles, uh, atmospheric climate scientist from University of Illinois, just came out Friday looking at the impacts of climate change for Illinois specifically, um, shows a devastating amount of heat waves, droughts, and impacts on the yield of our corn and soy. Uh, he goes into a variety of insect-borne diseases that we're all going to see from the tick-borne Lyme disease to West Nile disease because of warming of Illinois and more of a breeding ground for Illinois, uh, breeding period, I should say. So um, more and more impacts will be felt personally from where we live here in Chicago. Um, so I think, Harriet, is that what you're referring to? Yes, uh, I am, because it's getting, as I said, the ozone made our air terrible and uh, the lake is rising. They tell people to be careful now. Yes, may not be may not be Florida and the Atlantic, but it's happening here. It is. It's happening everywhere around the world. And it's it's a matter of connecting the dots. And um, uh, it's the same argument people may have where they say, hey, you know, how can climate change be a deal? I mean, it's cold here. And, it, and how how is the planet warming if it's cold here? Well, you got to remember, there's twenty eight thousand instruments measuring temperature put throughout our planet from the east to the west to the north to the south to the top of the highest mountain to the lowest part of our ocean you add it all together and our earth is warming. now that doesn't mean that you can't have a cold piece place somewhere on our planet and a really hot place but when you average it all out without question our planet is warming so um we just have to connect the dots and see that we've got an issue. We don't want to wait until the tipping points have been reached to say, oh, gee, I guess it is real. Let's do something about it because then it's too late, guys. Then we hit these positive feedback loops and um, the worst fears of our scientific community will be realized. And then trying to pull out of it, it will be extremely expensive, very difficult and dicey whether we can stop um, – a positive feedback loop that can really pull us down and, and create a tremendous loss of life. Uh, so um, I won't go any negative, more negative than that, but yeah, we all got to get busy and I think we can do that. Henry, are you, is there, are we writing to the president now? Can you, t is there any kind of campaign? Yes. A lot of um, what's been going on with um with carbon pricing these days and with the infrastructure plan, a lot of climate solution policies being tucked into the infrastructure plan. But there's real concern that the Biden administration won't put a carbon price. And at the end of the day, if you don't price what you don't want, you can't minimize it. And so for political reasons, I think Biden is hesitant to put a price on carbon and get that into policy as an enduring piece of legislation that if we get a Republican, uh, our next presidency, excuse me, it can't be torn down because it's locked in in policy. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but we're advocating for President Biden to put a price on carbon. So um, I can share a postcarding effort where we're asking President Biden to please put a price on carbon. And um, I can only say this, if you want to participate, I'll send it to Beth, Harriet, and then they can bring it out to you. You can put a picture of yourself doing whatever at the beach or just you and your family that you care about our climate and you want President Biden to please put a price on carbon. It goes right to the White House to President Biden. I'll say this, good chance this infrastructure plan, God willing, will get it through. And it might be pieced off some for the Republicans so they get their win. And then maybe budget reconciliation will take care of the rest of it. I don't know. But within that budget reconciliation, I am very hopeful that there'll be a carbon price within that budget reconciliation. And even though Biden might be hesitant, you got to remember, you got Janet Yellen, uh, Treasury Secretary, who is advocating for carbon pricing, and Gina McCarthy, the head guru on climate, who's just a wonderful human being, she's all about carbon price. 
So I got a feeling, you know, Biden said in one of his speeches, timing is everything. Great presidents are all about timing. He's timing it. He's playing the game. And I hope carbon pricing can be a part of it. But we got to remind him. So the postcarding effort, asking Biden, specifically reaching out to him to put a price on carbon will certainly help. So I'll send that information to, uh, to Beth and Harriet. And then you guys, if you want to do that, that's another way that you can advocate. Let, let me um, go on here. Yes, I will send in, um, information with these lists and the CCL USA to um, the people who've attended this. We will also mention the um, uh, postcard in our next, next week's Take Action Today weekly bulletin that goes out. So we'll have a lot of time to do this. Wonderful. Um, I've got a few more questions and then several of them are yours, Merle. So can I go ahead here <laughs> and they'll get to you. Um, Merle's final written question is, I believe we have more than one chance to do this right. So I wanna say, yes, Merle, you're right. That's, that's absolutely right that we have one chance to do it right. Um, one of her, and then you'll, oh, Henry, you'll also include um, bill numbers. Um, Merle says, when can we expect a nationwide distribution system for solar or wind-based power? Well, uh, when can we expect a nationwide? That is a process that will take time. Uh, we have to transition away from fossil fuel to clean energy. That means we need to strip the subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, number one, provide tax credits for solar, wind, and geothermal. And we need to provide government funding to develop the low carbon technologies that will not only develop solar and wind, but be able to effectively store it and keep the green premium to a minimum or none at all. So it actually becomes less expensive than what we're all currently paying. So we're able to appeal to the American people through their wallets. So many of the American people don't, don't really Go ahead. Go ahead, Meryl. Distributing. So there's a lot of wind in the southwestern United States, but there are not many people there. It's, it's, it's people up north who need the energy that can be produced by solar and by wind. It, it, it's not just in the localities where, where they have those benefits. So to right. build a grid, to build a distribution grid is going to be incredibly expensive. And, you know, people talk about, so if the guys in the coal mines don't have jobs and the guys at the oil derricks don't have jobs, we have to train them to do these other things. But, you know, we're talking about building, if, if everybody, if half the car owners own electric battery cars. We need to have tens of thousands of stations where they can refuel, where they can recharge. We don't have those stations now. On our highways, we still have ESO and Standard and Mobile and God, what I, I don't even know the names of them. Um, so, why isn't that talked about? We know our bridges are aging, our highways are aging, but we want to accommodate. We need to start building now. The government I, more money. I, I agree with you, Meryl, but um, it is a monumental task. And uh, we do need to have a new smart power grid, and it's going to be a monumental task effort. We need to mobilize like we did in World War II. We need to mobilize like we did with the race to the uh, moon. And I mentioned the great American ethos of can-do spirit. We can do it. We need to fund it. We need to strip away. You, do you, the subsidies for the fossil fuel industry are $70 billion a year. Okay. If we took away the subsidies, you would not be paying $3 at the gas pump. You'd be paying more like 15 or $20 per gallon at the gas pump. So those subsidies are going to slowly bark to be stripped away. There'll be more funding to develop charging stations for our electric vehicles. 
there'll be more funding to develop the smart power grid so that we can actually transfer power from the Sun Belt out to the east. There is all sorts of new technologies from generating electricity through wave technology, wave kinetics, industrial waste heat to energy. There, there are many brilliant technologies that we need to develop. So that will help us get everything fired up. It will take time. It'll take a concentrated effort and it takes a president like President Biden to use his bully pulpit to say, it's urgent, we gotta do it and we gotta do it now and then work with a divided Congress to get the job done and using budget reconciliation to an earlier question, do you ever think we're gonna get bipartisanship? Harriet, I think that was you. Idealistically, yes, I'd love it. Realistically, considering that, I don't know how many Republicans was it that would not certify the election and they're still talking about that. Yeah. They, the Democrats were worried about Republicans carrying arms into the Congress and they had to have them go through metal detection tests. I mean, it. I don't think with the polarization that we have, we're going to get bipartisanship, but we can do omnibus bills, big bills with climate change tucked in. And I think budget reconciliation, if everything works out, we can get a carbon pricing piece through budget reconciliation and budget reconciliation allows a 10 year commitment. So if a Republican gets in office, it won't be stripped away. It can't be because it's enduring law. So I don't know. I, I flunked crystal ball, guys. I can't tell you what's going to happen. I only know that we want to get our carbon pricing leaders from Congress, Durbin, Deutsch, White House, Braun, Coons, all talking. So it's important for us to support them, thank them, appreciate their carbon pricing bills. Let them get in the room. Let's sit down and talk and, and hone the best carbon pricing bill and make sure that that goes through budget reconciliation. Then, Merle, it's going to take time to build that smart power grid, the charging stations, to convert our public transport to electrification. It's a monumental effort. We've got to start. And that's what we did in World War II after Pearl Harbor. That's what we did to get a man on the moon. And that's what we're going to have to do in a big way to solve climate change. I hope, hope that answers your question partially. And then we can take more of this offline if you want. Um, let me ask you, yeah, and, and I think we're all here to do this, and, and I, I think it's important to thank um, Durban and Deutsch and others as, as much as anything else, because when all they hear is complaints, yep, it just tends to get stacked in the pile, but if it's thank you, they're going to put it out and mention it. Let me ask you one other little technical question, and we'll start to round up. Um, how much truth is it that animals um, are a huge source of methane, agricultural animals, cattle, cows, pigs. Well, um, they do contribute a, to methane, but is it huge? Um, yes, it is huge. And um, meat production, our cattle ranches, yes, they're they're a huge huge source of methane. It's not just the uh, feces, the manure. Um, that is the issue, but it's the belching as well. And um, uh, if you if you look at it in a in a full spectrum way, we're, Bolsonaro is cutting down rainforest to make pasture land available for raising beef for McDonald's. You know, so now you compound it where you have a loss of carbon sequestration from our rainforests because you're growing cattle, which is belching and and manuring and putting more methane up in the atmosphere. So it's a huge source. The other huge source that people don't think about is our food waste. We waste, believe it or not guys, 40% of the food on our table is wasted. You throw it in the garbage, it goes to the landfill, it gets more garbage put on it and it gets compressed. And it's just like what I told you with permafrost, all that food waste begins to decompose but it's compressed and it decomposes without oxygen and methane comes up. You've all seen uh, um, dumps with a pipe coming out of the ground and being flared off. 
that's methane. Um, and not all of it is flared off. Much of it emanates out of the landfill. So methane is uh, out of landfills. Methane from our cattle farms is a huge problem. Um, did you, I, I don't know if you all have read um, Bill Gates' book, the latest one that he had. I, I'm just about done with it. But, um, you know, he's talking about harnessing landfill methane to um, burn the methane and drive a generator to produce electricity as a way to take something negative and turn it into a positive. But uh, also he talked about, uh, and I'm sure you've seen it, it's not just impossible foods or beyond meat, which is the, the plant-based uh, food to replace our hamburgers and meat that we all love. But they're talking about actually taking cells and, and generating them in a lab. So it, it's actually meat lab grown, which is kind of freaky, but it beats the belching and the manuring from our cattle farms and the destruction of our forests to create pasture land. It's like a, a double, double whammy where we're hurting ourselves here. So it's a, that's a big question. And getting people to give up their meat isn't going to happen unless we have a really good alternative. And um, it is a big source of climate change. So why is not included in the act? Nothing against the agricultural industry or, or no, I wouldn't say against, but uh, you know, confrontational with the agricultural industry is in the act, either one of the acts. While everything is focused on carbon and uh, on the oil industry and such. It's uh, Elena. Elena, that's a great question, and it's it's only my my um, ability to cover everything in every bill. It, I mean, Durbin's bill is 80 pages, a lot of detail in there, and um, uh, Deutsch's bill is pretty long as well. Uh, Congress.gov is where you can do it. And just real quick, S-685 is Durbin bill, and HR-2703 is Deutsch's bill, Congress. .gov is where you can get an actual copy of the bill and read it. Um, Deutsch has just reintroduced his bill, so it isn't up just yet, but it will be. Um, but to answer your question, agriculture is a big source of our problem, and it is a huge opportunity to solve our problem. Real quick, um, it is the cattle ranching that definitely is the problem, and our our high salt nitrogen fertilizer is the other problem that actually is great for growing corn and soy. They, they, they put a lot of the synthetic nitrogen down, grows our plants, but it also kills off the microbiology of the soil. And so there's all, I mean, there's a whole lecture we could talk just about soil and how soil sequesters carbon through microbial, um, the microbial cycles. Um, so regenerative agriculture is the phrase. And it's uh, when you go to Whole Foods and something grown organically, it's typically grown in a regenerative way. So instead of synthetic nitrogen, we're doing things the old fashioned way. Now, how much we can um, scale this up is something that everybody's working on to figure out how can we develop the fertilizers of the future that don't destroy the microbiology that sequesters carbon from the air, but actually is helping microbial community because soil is a huge carbon sink. We can sequester carbon in our soils if we have an abundant microbiology within the soil that naturally occurs, but our farmlands the commercial farmlands have killed off that microbiology. So there's huge pieces in both bills about regenerative agriculture. Um, and there's incentives to develop alternative meat production. So um, there's huge pieces of that in both of the bills. I hope that answers it, Elena. Elena. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And um, Paula Walrich um, just said that she lives in DuPage County in one of the forest preserves is Green Valley Forest Preserve, which used to be a dump. Now they use the methane to power all the forest preserve vehicles. There and I believe about 1,800 homes worth of power. So thank you, Paula. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. That's a great use of methane. And um, it's, it's really interesting. As a side note, guys, um, they've talked about using methane for years as a green, 
they call it renewable natural gas, RNG. You've all seen the dump trucks that say, we use natural gas, we're great, lower carbon emissions. I'm going, okay, how about renewable natural gas, which is methane? So they can do it, but the natural gas industry fought like heck and lobbied like heck to say, uh uh, cytokines uh, from the natural methane will wreck our pipes. Therefore, you can't use it, you can't distribute it because you're going to destroy our pipes. So there's a lot of um, politics involved in making change because people that are making money want to keep the status quo. So it's, it's going to take all of us being squeaky wheels to make the difference. Henry, thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I'm going to put, yes, um, send out a, a summary to everyone, including the bill numbers. And I'll double check with you the, the places to write. I had them down. Um, and we'll include that and we'll include it in our, our newsletters. That's so, wonderful. And it's wonderful. And Beth and Harriet and um, uh, Meryl, the, the three women that I've been most in touch with, I will send you information um, because uh, I talk with urban staffers quite often, and uh, I often have different customized letters that I send to the Durban office specifically. Huh. Same with Congressman Schneider. And I'll send those letters to you so you get some ideas. Maybe you can publish that to the group. Okay. And maybe that will be an easy copy and paste for them to send directly. Um, Super. Guys, I can't stress enough that, that the, the solution to climate change at the end of the day, it falls on all of us. It really does. And in any great social movement, um, whatever it is, it was always about the common citizen being out in the streets, making the calls, doing the emails. It's always about grassroots, boots on the ground, people like us making the difference. And if you look at it, um, whether it's end of slavery, civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, nuclear disarmament, end of the Vietnam War, and, and recently police reform, right? Equal justice. It's all about common folk like us making the difference, being the squeaky wheel. So um, Harriet has talked very glowingly about all of the members here being very strong willed and very much into advocacy. So um, I will be happy to continue our conversation uh, and, and be as much help to you as you care to have. And I, I love your passion and thank you for hearing a third lecture or a presentation, <laughs> I'll say, on climate change. You guys rock. Thank you so much. And All right. thank you. Yeah, this is terrific. Um, and they, um, our next month program will be about the Momnibus bill and emphasizing how we can help with black maternal health. So a little plug there for it. Wonderful. So, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you and, so much. This was excellent. Good. Yeah. Glad you liked it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Henry. Though I sounded very contrarian, <laughs> I am a I am a big supporter, and um, you gave us a lot of fuel in a very yeah. presentation. Thank you. Well, Meryl, Mer I love your questions, and it's good to be questioning and and putting my feet to the fire and you can do that anytime and if i can't come up with an answer i'll do my best to find you one how's that perfect thank okay. you perfect. all right thank you so much all good right night. guys good night everyone good, good night. night take care everyone night.